So, beautiful weather we're having outside, right? We go from <laughs> freezing cold to fog. <laughs> and you, it's like, it never fails, man. We can always be humid in Corpus Christi, right? It's just amazing. <laughs> Such a blessing. Anyways, I hear it's good for your skin. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, we're in the book of Acts. So, where we are in the book of Acts is Paul has completed his first missionary journey. And uh, it was a blessing. He planted churches, so on and so forth. He encouraged those churches. And uh, then the last thing we looked at was there was a conflict in the church about legalism. Like, how religious looking do you have to be to actually be saved, right, ultimately? And uh, we looked at this issue, and it isn't so much an issue for us, you know, and in not offending uh, Jews that might be interested in the gospel by eating certain foods or whatever, but it can offend us because we have an idea of what Christianity looks like, and we always want to put Christians in our little box, you know. A uh, story about Raul Reese, and I don't know if you guys know who Raul Reese is, but uh, Raul Reese uh, was a Vietnam vet, a man's man. He was a, like a fifth degree uh, black belt in some martial arts. He's considered a master in this particular martial art in America and, and across the world. And, you know, he, he's a man's man, right? And uh, so he, he went to India, and in India, wh when you preach, you kind of wear this dress thing. <laughs> and he's like, no way, man, I ain't wearing that dress. <laughs> you know? And uh, certainly a real Christian can't wear a dress and preach, you know, but certainly uh, that was just a cultural thing, and it wasn't truly a dress. It was more of what, uh, what traditional men would wear there. It would be like us wearing a suit, you know. And uh, so we have these ideas, and we judge each other by these ideas, whether they be a ball cap during worship or tattoos or, you know, um, the, the style of your dress, so on and so forth, you know. And so we can be very bigoted and biased towards people and not really looking at the true essentials that make someone a believer and really encouraging not just the look of a believer, but the deep down inside transformation because you've been possessed by the Holy Spirit. That's what it's all about, right? You know, and, and I think God can overlook your tattoos if your heart is growing, you know, and uh, God can overlook your, uh, your uh, ratty hair or your, <laughs> your uh, nasty, uh, you know, socks or whatever, you know, as long as you are growing in the Lord, you know, and, and I was reminded the other day, we were talking about homeless ministry and, and all, and one time, my wife and I were involved in a homeless outreach. We did it probably twice a month or so, and it was just on our own. It wasn't even through the church. It was some people that kind of went out on their own. They were musicians. They, you know, they had Christ Afari playing a park <laughs> for a bunch of homeless people, and there we met this man, and, and he looked very homeless, but he ended up living in a trailer, and we invited him to our house, and instead of us ministering to him, he ministered to us, and I tell you what, it was humbling. And it was a huge blessing. When he left, both my wife and I looked at each other and go, did we just entertain an angel? And I don't know, very well could have been. <laughs> you know, it was just an amazing thing, you know, because we have all these preconceived ideas of what it should be. In all reality, the Lord gives us what is truly important in the scriptures. And so there's a, an argument about religiosity. And actually, those that were Gentiles were freed up from following the Jewish law. Uh, they were asked to do a few things in order not to offend the Jewish brethren that might become believers or even the Jewish brethren that are, that are still a little uptight about the Jewish culture. And so that's what we looked at last time. And so what happened is you had the center of people in Antioch that were pretty much the center of the Gentile evan uh, evangelism. And then you had Jerusalem, which was pretty much the center of Jewish evangelism. A and so they went back and forth and they got some instruction from the leaders there in Jerusalem. So now we're picking up in Acts chapter 15, verse 30. And it says, So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and they had gathered the multitude together, and they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. And so they read this letter that said, you didn't have to become Jewish to, be, to, to believe in God. You know, and, and we give you some instructions not to be offensive. And so they rejoiced. Now, the question is, did everybody rejoice? Did all rejoice? Well, I doubt if all rejoiced. Why? Because those that were trying to get everybody to be Jewish and were believers were looking at this going, no, 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 right? 
When someone tells you no, you want to say yes. When someone says don't, you want to do. And when someone tells, says you're wrong, you want to defend yourself, don't you? It's human nature. But as we read Proverbs, and I just finished Proverbs in my devotional life, and man, it was so hard to get through because there's so much good stuff there, right? And, and, and one place in Proverbs, it says, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. Problem with instruction, though, sometimes you're instructed differently than what you initially believed. And it's hard to change, isn't it? But I tell you what, as a believer, you need to learn to change. Because you started off a filthy sinner, and now you're just a little bit less of a filthy sinner. <laughs> and when you get to heaven, you want to be even a little bit less of a filthy sinner, right? And, and, and we're, we're continually being challenged by God. We're being corrected by him. The last part of that verse says, but he who hates correction is stupid. And th that wasn't my word. <laughs> you know, that was in the New King James. You know, don't be stupid by rejecting correction. And unfortunately, as a pastor, I run into it all the time. And instead of getting mad, it actually breaks my heart. Because I'm not going out there with my own ideas. I'm going in to correct somebody because I care about them. And I'm using God's words and God's principles. Because I know, just as well as anybody else, if they're my ideas, they're, they're just temporary. But if they're God's ideas, they're internal, eternal, and they change lives. And so these men would have been, in a sense, slapped in the face. I don't know how they responded. It doesn't say. Spurgeon said, I bear my willing witness that I owe more to the fire and the hammer and the file, file than to anything else in the Lord's workshop. I sometimes question whether I have ever learned anything except through the rod. I like that, getting a plug from the, you know. The Prince of Preachers. When my schoolroom is darkened, I see the most. And, and what he's saying is it's those painful hurts and those corrections that we go through. Those are the lessons we learn the deepest, isn't it? And, and, and so that's what he's saying. So sometimes when we go through a heavy correction, it's, ouch, I don't like it, but I can still praise God for the lesson that I got through it, Right? And so if these guys responded, they, well, they would have been better off uh, in the end. And so, you know, I used to sit out in sermons when I was just freshly rededicated my heart to the Lord. And uh, we would sit out there and we loved getting nailed by the Lord because we wanted to be better, right? And we didn't want this, you know, cotton candy style sermon. And so we'd sit there and we'd go, shh, <laughs> You know, when something hit us, you know. And so my friends and I, we'd be, you know, three or four of us going, shh, poof, and shh, poof, that's for you, you know, kind of thing, and going back and forth. But, but we learn through those, those hard lessons and those things that are straight up telling us how it is. Tom Landry, who was a, a, a Christian coach of the Dallas Cowboys, don't know if any of you have ever heard of him before, but uh, he says the job of a football coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. And isn't that what the Lord does for us? He challenges us through hard times. You know, it's been said, I think Francis Chan said that, he said, the, the, to get married, the blessing of getting married is you've been given an opportunity to grow up, to mature, right? Because all of a sudden you realize you're not as awesome as you always thought you were. <laughs> And you're reflecting that off of someone who, who wakes up right next to you in your face. <laughs> and so we go through these trials and we grow. But it says there the rest did rejoice. They rejoiced. Why? Because they already knew the answer by the Spirit, didn't they? All of a sudden, they've been set free. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. This controversy is going on, and they're saying, I know God. This is incredible. You're telling me I have to be circumcised, have to do these certain festivals, have to eat these certain ways in order to, to enjoy God? I already am. So what was happening was they were rejoicing because their spirit bore witness with the truth. And, and when these people came in and started saying this, 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 and this, it just bummed them out. It bummed them out. And, and the big question would be, you know, that they were waiting on, would the council in Jerusalem decide that they really were not saved after all because they had not submitted to circumcision and the law of Moses? And certainly they wouldn't have if they truly understood the message of Jesus. 
there are many lists for you to follow out there. But you need to understand, Jesus plus something else does not save you. Jesus saves you completely. Now, obedience to those things that make him rejoice is just natural. He saved you. You want to respond well. But response is way different than requirement. And, and, and you know, if my wife says, oh, thank you for making me that coffee, and I go, well, I just did it because you make me, it's a lot different. You know, I made coffee for her, and she says, thank you so much for making my coffee. I'm like, oh, no worries, honey. There's a difference, isn't there? I love my wife, therefore I make her coffee. Instead of, oh, it's required of me. I read it in a book somewhere. Just drink your coffee. <laughs> you know, I mean, how are you going to respond to God, you know? So they rejoiced. And then it goes on to verse 32, and it says, Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So Judas and Silas here were, were some of those sent from Jerusalem, and they were mentioned here as prophets. And I want you to notice it says, being prophets, what did they do? They exhorted and they strengthened the brethren with many words. They encouraged them. They built them up. They were used by the Lord to strengthen the brethren and build up, not to tear down. It's interesting as a you know, in Calvary Chapel, we do believe in, in the gifts for today, and, and we believe that they're supposed to be operated in the way that the, the, the Bible lays out. And so, you know, charismatics think we're Baptists, and Baptists think we're charismatics, you know, or uh, Pentecostals, you know. So we're kind of in the middle there. Um, but we do certainly rely on the Holy Spirit for, for everything. And, uh, and so um, sometimes we'll have a time just where there's prayer and open prayer, and someone can read, read a Bible verse or give an exhortation and, and sometimes what happens during those times is people come in there with a chip on their shoulder and it isn't the holy spirit <laughs> it is a spirit <laughs> but it's a human spirit just trying to discourage everybody because they're upset you know and just drill and nail everybody that must be the holy spirit you know and uh and the thing is whenever you see the holy spirit speaking he's speaking encouragement building up lifting up foretelling and foretelling Okay, In the New Testament, that's what it appears as. We don't see it any other way. A and so, listen, there is not a ministry of tearing down and accusing the brethren. You know, that, that, that's not a spiritual gift. Nailing is not a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> blasting. I have the spiritual gift of blasting a brother or sister in the Lord, you know. Oh, but what if they need correction, Pastor? The Bible says you humbly go to them, considering even yourself, lest you fall into that same temptation. And if you come in love, you can, you can give them some pretty heavy stuff, but you're doing it in an encouraging way, aren't you? And you're trying to build them up, aren't you? But if you're just angry at them and you blast them, that's the flesh, guys. So, so, we don't, so, so, so you see, these men are, are mentioned as prophets. So these are named as prophets. Why would they be named as prophets? Well, probably because what they said and how they encouraged the people rang true more often than not. You see what I'm saying? So, so you know, I, I'm a believer that if you're filled with the Spirit and you have gifts of the Spirit, they show up in your everyday life all the time. It's not, you don't have to wait till the third Sunday evening of the month or, or, or the, the second Wednesday of the month when we have our family time. Uh, and, and an open time, and, and, and it doesn't have to be in front of a bunch of people. It doesn't have to be in Old King James English. Thus saith the Lord. I think if you're filled with the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, you're 24-7 a believer. And so if you wake up in the middle of the night with something pounding upon your chest, write it down. Or if it's a need for prayer, pray for it. If it's a verse that God wants you to send to somebody, wake up in the morning and send them a text. See what I'm saying? Like, it happens all the time. And if you're out, you know, on vacation or if you're, it's your day off, listen, and someone needs prayer, you can pray for them and you can allow the Holy Spirit to fill your prayers with his wisdom and his knowledge through words of wisdom and words of knowledge even as you pray. See what I'm saying? So I really believe that, it, that it's not always in a formal setting. In fact, I think it's probably more often than not in a, in a more casual setting that the Spirit wants to move through you guys. How many hours a day 
are you the Lord's? If it's 24-7, then you're the Lord's 24-7, and the Spirit can move through you. And so, so in my experience, you know, I had a friend. His name was, his name was Carrie, and uh, he was a good friend. He was there when I rededicated my heart to the Lord um, at 24. And, uh, you know, we, we're still friends even today. Uh, 31, no, five years later, just kidding. Um, <laughs> 31 years later, we're still, we're still friends, you know. And uh, this guy just tends to have more of that in his life. He's very quiet. He's not a big talker or anything else, you know. But, but it just tends to happen in his life. He doesn't showboat or anything else. But God used him in my life in so many ways and so many times because he's more consistent in that, right? And, uh, but listen, a lot of people walk around like an Old Testament prophet, right? But in the Old Testament and the New Testament, they have very different roles. What are you saying, pastor? Isn't a prophet a prophet? Well, a prophet is a prophet, but the situation changed. Because what happened in the New Testament is everybody is filled with the Spirit. The Spirit dwells in us because the death and life of Jesus Christ bought, bought the ability for us to be full-time cleansed, declared by God legally, right? So the Holy Spirit can dwell in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if someone has a gift of prophecy and, and has the Spirit of God in them, you as a recipient of that prophecy have just as much of the Spirit of God in you as they have in them. And the Old Testament understand that the Holy Spirit didn't even indwell people back then. The Holy Spirit came upon people like Samson. The Holy Spirit came upon people like David. And the Holy Spirit came upon Elijah and Elisha, but it wasn't a full-time possession of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and there's many other reasons why they have a different role in the New Testament. But, but understand that, um, you know, as the, the, all a prophet does is speak forth the heart and the thoughts of God to men. That's what he's doing. And it, take, it can take many different forms. But these guys were more consistent. Therefore, Paul writes to the Thessalonians for a New Testament believer. He says this, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. And so Paul is certainly aware that there's going to be prophecies out there. And don't be just rejecting all of them. But he says you have the ability because you have the Holy Spirit to do what? Test all things and hold on to that which is good. You see how that works? It's different in the New Testament. Therefore, if someone says, hey, I think the Lord gave me something for you. You, you know, you, you must buy a, um, an ice cream truck and drive around Corpus Christi, you know, with God's not dead blaring, and that's the ministry for the rest of your life. I can test that prophecy, and I don't have to kill the guy that gave it to me, right? Because we're, we're living in New Testament times. Our situation with God has changed, and therefore the way prophecies are given and received and tested are now different. You see how that works? So you don't have to be afraid of them. It, in this sense, these men were doing what? They were encouraging with words from God's heart. Do you guys like to be encouraged? How would you like to be encouraged from God's heart? All the better, right? And so it's something we shouldn't despise, says First Thessalonians, right? So another thing that, that I do believe, I believe that if you love God, his word, and his people, God will use you from time to time to speak his heart to his people. Is it just a verse you memorized and you have a heart for someone and so you give them that verse? Or is it actually a prophecy from God that actually lines up specifically with that particular verse? I don't know. Who cares? Just bless one another. Right? Because, because if, if you think it always has to be phrased in New King James English, you know, then you're going to go, is this a prophet from God? Is this not? A, you know, <laughs> thus saith the Lord, you know. Uh, you don't have to do that, guys. You be filled with the Spirit. You love God. You love His people. You know His Word. And then, even before it comes out of your mouth, you're able to test whether, you know, that ice cream truck is from the Lord or not. <laughs> you know? And I want you to know that we are to be filled with the Spirit so that what comes out of our mouth is from God. Paul wrote in, to the Ephesians, right before he talked about relationships, he says this, Do not be drunk with wine. Now, it's Super Bowl Sunday. I would say, do not be drunk with beer either, okay? Um, in which is dissipation. 
but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, so whenever I read this verse, I go to my wife, Honey, it's time to get up now. You know, I, right? It's, it sounds like what it's saying. What it's saying is, be filled with the Spirit so that you speak words that are blessed by God to one another. Right? In the previous chapter, Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is edifying to those that are going to receive it. Wow. Right? So how do I do that, man? You know, I keep on trying to convince God that sarcasm is a spiritual gift. And he just never buys it, right? You know, so I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to have to tape up my mouth for the rest of my life, you know? But you see how that works? Filled with the Spirit. So some of those words, as you're filled with the Spirit, are going to be words of wisdom that you're sharing with somebody. A word of wisdom is knowledge to fix a problem that you didn't necessarily think of uh, on your own. God's actually helping you help this other person come to a conclusion. We're helping one another, right? Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, after service, I don't want to hear anybody just talking. I want to hear you singing. <laughs> but what I do want to hear is I want you to be blessing one another. And, and, and you think about our behavior. Do we bless each other with, the, with, with good words? You know, oh, pastor, you don't know my past, but I do know who's indwelling you if you claim to be a believer. It's the Holy Spirit. And, and the best way to change your language is to be so full of things of God that from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I certainly am, I would never call myself a prophet of position. But how many times have, you know, I tell you, every week after service, people will say, Oh, you said this. And uh, I look at him and I go, yeah, you know, it's funny. That wasn't in my notes. And I'll tell you, it wasn't in my notes. That was for you from the Holy Spirit. I didn't know. But what am I doing? I'm speaking forth something from the heart of God directly to that person that may not have hit anybody else. No one else in the room may even have noticed it. And you know what? I got to be okay with that and just roll with it. Right? And, and just say, praise God. Or I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> I had a picture of you by my mirror when I was putting this together because I wanted to nail you, you know? And that's the joke, but it isn't. It's the Spirit just wanting to speak through you. And, and, and if you're open to that, God's going to use you in incredible ways. And you don't have to walk around, I'm a prophet. You don't have to wear, like, you know, your shirts. Get them all, like, trimmed so they hang down and you can look, like, you know, like really cool and holy or whatever. Be holy. Don't just look holy. <laughs> you know, be filled with the Spirit of God. Now, back in Acts chapter 15, if we can pull ourselves back after that, um, <laughs> verse 33, and it says, And after they had stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. And Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So the Spirit leads one to return to Jerusalem and the other to stay in Antioch. And what is happening here? Well, God is setting up Silas to go with Paul, right? So for whatever reason, Silas, as someone who was from Jerusalem, decided to stay in Antioch. And I really believe, as we're going to see, it was the Spirit of God that led him to do so. There's a point here. We should not try to make decisions based upon comfort, but rather based upon the leading of the Spirit. Right? Now, what does this mean? Well, I think we should pray about every decision that we make. And if it doesn't seem that, that God is leading us one way or another, we should make the most logical decision, given our, given our priorities. Okay, because God gives us priorities. And, and, and so there's some times where God will step in and make something very clear that doesn't seem as logical. It doesn't make as much sense. But when my wife and I were considering moving um, away from California, listen, I was on staff at a church with 4,000 members. I had a decent salary. I lived less than a mile from the church. 
My rent was $400, yes, in California, where it's not humid, $400 a month. Um, we had health insurance, we had two babies. Uh, my parents were alive, they lived about a mile and a half away. Noreen's parents were alive, they lived about two and a half miles away. At least once a week, we could soak a, a free meal out to dinner with either, <laughs> you know, my parents or her parents. Once or twice a week, that would happen. And, and uh, I have six brothers and sisters. My kids could have grown up with their 20 um, cousins right there in the area. And, uh, you know, we had it pretty good. I was speaking at youth pastor conferences. I had a lot of speaking engagements. And, you know, and, and I had a lot of good friends. You know, the place I grew up surfing, Trestles, was right down the road, you know, and it's a little bit better than Corpus Christi. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so the Lord led us to leave Southern California. And my pastor had even offered, hey, we will set you up next door because we'd moved out of Ontario, California into Chino, California as a church. And then he said, well, Ontario still needs a Calvary Chapel, so I'll plant you over there. Your first Sunday, you'll have 250 people. And we'll keep you on staff for a year and pay your salary. We'll even send over a worship team each week as you need it until you build up your own. Okay, so what are you going to do? You're going to move out to Corpus Christi without a job, your family, and not knowing anybody else, right? After growing up in Southern California. Guys, that was a stupid thing to do, logically. But the Lord was just pounding on our heart, go, 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 go. And the other option, we had two other options. I love Japan, and I'd been there six times and uh, love the people there, love the culture. So I was praying about moving to Japan as a missionary, and I, was, and I totally love Brazil, and you guys still know that. <laughs> I love Brazil. We helped plant two churches in Brazil even to, to today. Um, still uh, hopefully going to visit them this summer. But um, it was either Brazil or Japan, and then God stopped me, and he brought us to Corpus Christi, Texas. And, and that wasn't logical. It wasn't even comfortable. And you guys have heard some of the stories over the years about me crying and screaming at God. <laughs> you got me out here to kill me, <laughs> you know. And he did. He wanted to kill my flesh. But don't make decisions based upon comfort, but rather based upon the leading of the Spirit. Watch out for merely deciding via earthly profit, selfishness, or any other thing having, um, than having the agreement with the Spirit in us as believers. And Silas was moved to stay, but does not know why yet. And we're reminded of the famous verse, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And I'm always planned to the T and pray that the Lord interrupts. Because when he interrupts, it's so much more fun and so much more fruitful. So how does it happen that you're led by the Spirit? I keep on talking about that today. Well, if you're in a good marriage... Or if you have a good working relationship with your boss or overseer or even with your workers, you know how the other will think, how the other will answer, or the basic direction that they will probably go in. And how do you get to know someone that well? You spend time with them, right? Uh, I, I had a former assistant pastor, now an assistant pastor in Houston, um, Doug Hoffman, and uh, you know, taking a lot of mission trips myself and having a heart for missions. And when, when the church was younger, it was kind of Doug and I making all the decisions, right? And so he says, hey, Rod, this happened. And I go, so what'd you do? Well, he said, I would have done it this way, but I knew what you would do, so we did it this way. And I go, ah, oh, good job, Doug. <laughs> you know, because he knew we had a good working relationship. We knew each other since the fourth grade. You know, we knew each other so well that he could second guess me. But is your relationship with God like that to where you recognize the, the, the normal way that God works with you because you're spending so much time with God. Recognize how he speaks to you and works through you and recognize the way he works in general, in, in the word of God. And, and that's how you get to know the heart of God in a general sense. And so when you're praying, you're not trying to figure out the general direction. You already know the general direction. You're just asking for the specifics, right? And so when my wife says, well, let, we need to go to, to this restaurant. I don't know exactly where the restaurant is. I can be driving in that direction and then go, okay, so do I take a turn here or here? And it's a lot easier to do that than for me to sit there and go, until I know the whole path, I'm not going to leave. How do I get there? You see what I'm saying? And so we're moving in the general direction God wants to get us, 
by knowing him and knowing his word and how it works. And then the specifics are, are supplied by the spirit of God. And you need to know him well in order to hear him well and recognize his voice at all times. Now, as we move on today, we're going to look at a conflict between two spiritual giants, Paul and Barnabas, right? And this is a controversial passage because some people say Paul was right and other people say Barnabas was right. I'm going to tell you they were both right and they were both wrong, okay? I'll be right in the middle. <laughs> But verse 36 goes on, it says, Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, here's the assumption that God was going to send out the same team on the second missionary journey as he sent out on the first. So they were assuming upon God. There was nothing wrong at this point. Everything was right about caring about those who they've ministered to in the past and going out and making sure they're doing well. But the question I have for you is, where was the prayer? Did these guys pray and fast with the elders of the church to figure out where, when, and who with they should have gone out with? Verse 37 goes on to say, Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. On their first missionary journey, Barnabas took his nephew. And it got a little tough. And he had promised to go with them on the whole trip, and he didn't go. He bailed out in the middle and went back to Jerusalem. Now he's there again in Antioch. Barnabas wants to take him along, and Paul says, nope, he's unproven. He caused us a lot of problems last time. I don't want to take him with me. And so the problem arises. There was a determination by Barnabas to restore his nephew, bring him along with him, and there was a declaration by Paul that this young man should not go. But the mention of setting apart a team by the Spirit, which we saw in the first missionary journey, is not there. Remember with me, Acts chapter 13, verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and, and Saul for the work for which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and they, from there they sailed to Cyprus. So who was wrong? Was Paul wrong? to be cautious over Mark, who had abandoned them? Was that a real problem? Was he wrong for going, we shouldn't take him, he bailed out? No, that wasn't wrong, was it? Was Barnabas wrong because he wanted to give a Mark a second chance and restore him? What a horrible guy. Was that wrong? Neither of those things was wrong. So are they both right? Yeah. Yeah. But neither seem to consult the Lord at this time. They're both right and they're both wrong at the same time. Verse 39. Then the contention. And I'm going to say this wasn't a little bickering. This was a schism in the Greek. Became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by their brethren to the grace of God. Now, personally, I see this as God's original plan. They just didn't get there in the right way. They didn't get there in the right way. Silas, again, was led before this to stay there. And now he's a partner with Paul. And, and so they went to one place. Barnabas went to another. God had a plan. He wanted to restore Mark. And he wanted this mission team to go back out but it's a different team. But they just didn't pray about it. They didn't do it God's way. But they ended up doing God's thing, I very much believe. I don't want to say Paul was right and they should have abandoned Mark. And I don't want to say Barnabas was right and Paul's just driven. Because Paul did all kinds of awesome things for the Lord on his trip, as we will see. 
So now, pastor, you're saying, oh, it's good to have a schism. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's not good to disagree sharply. But in the end, as you're surrendered to God, he can still bring out a good result. God, want, God got them where he wanted them to be. And even through sharpness and probably some initial hurt feelings. Chuck Smith says of this passage, he says, now we see an interesting thing in that there are two powerful church leaders getting in an argument so severe that they split company. Now, is it that these men of God cannot agree? Is it possible that God wanted two missionary teams instead of one in order to cover twice the territory? Because that was the net result of the contention. Barnabas took Mark and they, sailed, they headed off to Cyprus. Paul then took Silas and they headed off to Cilicia and they went all, uh, went all the way over to Europe on this journey. But God now had two teams instead of one. Thus the effect of it, the overall effect of it was good as far as the church was concerned because it broadened their whole missionary endeavor. Listen, the worst thing you can do is not merely sin. Sin's a bad thing. But the worst thing you can do is sin and not realize you've sinned or repent of your sin or return to the Lord, right? The only difference between Peter and Judas ultimately in their actions was Peter rejected God and repented. Judas did not. See the difference? And the difference between some of the evil kings and King David is the fact that David realized he repented and he returned to the Lord every time. And he was called a man after God's own heart. Now, it is interesting to note, and you may not know the whole story or you may know the whole story, but when Paul is in the final year of his life, he's writing to Timothy. Second Timothy, the last letter from Paul that we have. He's in prison in Rome, and things are not looking good. He feels like he's going to perish because he's going to soon be facing Nero, who was determined to persecute the Christians. The Christians. And so Paul realizes his death is a real possibility, and he writes to Timothy. He tells him, my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've basically, I've, I've come to the end. I've kept the faith. I'm done great way to finish right just done but then he says to timothy in second timothy 4 11 only luke is with me i have one guy that's hanging out with me from my original team in jail here but he says this to timothy get mark how cool is that get mark and bring him with me or bring him with you to me for he is useful to me for ministry. See how God works? And you know, you might think, well, John blew it. He doesn't deserve to be restored. But God always tries to restore. You might think you're so far out there that you're not restorable. You might think your marriage is beyond help. But it's not. Because God does these things. And this guy was a notorious loser. And then what happens? Paul, of all people tells him bring him i need him this is my last days he's very useful to me what a huge blessing isn't it don't give up on yourself give yourself over to god and see what he has for you paul had also written to philemon and he speaks of those that are with them bringing greetings to philemon and he mentions marcus who is the one who was there with him sending in the greetings so he got there how cool is that so, the differences that did exist were ultimately patched up. Guys, this is how it should be with believers. As much as possible, it, as it is within you, live at peace with all men. You know, I, I did a, a study one time at a pastor's conference, and I said, don't write people off. Don't write people off. Guys, it's so easy because pastors carry so much emotions, and we go through so many trials in so many different people's lives. Guys, my life is so easy, but my life is very hard. It's easy in the sense that my wife and I love the Lord, and yeah, we go through some things, but not any worse than anybody else, and we have such incredible support and so many people that love us and want to pray. I have an awesome life. My life is also hell, 
Because I go through every divorce. I go through every affair. I go through every drug addiction. I go through every death of a child. I go through every death of a spouse. It happens in this church. And, and, and I laughed. I looked at my wife, and I go, and it's probably more than this. I go, when, when we get in spats, you know what? It's probably about at least 90% of the spats we get in are not about us. It's about things happening in the church because both of us are so wrapped up in people's lives, right? It's just, it's just the nature of it. That's why my salary is a million dollars a year. <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> but in that, and, and my point was, we as pastors can get hurt so much that when someone that is causing hurt towards us, we want to write them off in order to feel better emotionally. The problem is, once we write someone off, a little bit of our heart dies. And the love that God wants to show through us is no longer showing through us in that one area. And how many people do we write off before we've written off everybody? And we become isolated, and we become corporate pastors who never want to do a counseling appointment or never want to do a hospital visitation or go on the mission field. We lock ourselves up in the office, and we're just that guy, whoo, the untouchable. And from what I can tell in the scriptures, that's not what the apostles did. And that's not what the church leaders did in the early church. They got down and dirty with people. And you know what? I've found over the years, my heart gets broken all the time. And it's not just broken, because you can glue something that's broken back together. My heart gets squashed all the time, like a tomato. Glue that back together. The only one that can do that is the Lord, and it's an amazing thing. Every year I quit the ministry probably 10 times. Bad years, 20 times. Good years, 5 times. You know, I mean, that's just how it goes, right? And I've, I've been in ministry leadership for 30 years. I've, that's a whole lot of quitting. Why in the world am I still here? Because I'm so amazing. I am not amazing, guys. God, my God is amazing. To where I can go, wow, I still have a heart. I still care about people. I walk into church on Sunday mornings and I interrupt half you guys during worship because I want to give you a hug because I love to be here on Sunday mornings because that's when I see most of you. And I love that. You know? I walk in, I see Abel in the back. Give him a big hug. You know, I, I walk up here to Goliath and I give him a big <laughs> hug. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I hug him like kind of around his hips, you know. <laughs> yeah, I see Bernie and, and I want to sit and wor worship with Bernie, you know. And, and I thank God that he can do that or else I would be so removed from people, you know. And uh, total tangent here, where am I? Um, <laughs> oh, this idea of writing people off, I don't think Paul did it. I can imagine Paul praying for Barnabas and praying for Mark while he's on his trip with Silas. I couldn't imagine him not doing that. And you know what? There's reconciliation. Isn't that beautiful? And, and, and you know, I, I fight for reconciliation with those people that have attacked me. And some people say, just write them off, write them off. You know, blessed subtraction. Oh, shut up. But there's some people that still don't like me and, and, and everything. That's as much as possible within me. I want to live at peace with all men. And it's very hard. You know, it, it's a hard thing to do. But man, I have peace with God because I'm willing to do that. And I don't want my. It's so hard to keep a heart alive and keep on caring as it is. So I don't want to kill my heart person by person. So I want to encourage you don't write people off. Keep on praying for them, and when you have the ability, try to be united with them. Now, it says here, Paul went through these places, Syria and Cilicia, in verse 41, strengthening the churches, right? He's strengthening the churches. One of Paul's main goals was to strengthen the churches. 1 Timothy 3.14, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm a de delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So he's building up the church, and Paul understands that churches are God's way of discipleship. 
It's God's way of growing mature believers. A lot of people say, you know, I love God. I just hate the church members. Well, here's the deal. You're going to grow up by learning to love those that you don't love. Right? That's how you grow up. That's how you know the Lord's working in here. Guys, by, by, by nature, I'm an introvert. I like to be alone. Isn't that weird? Why am I a pastor? To prove that God is good. That it's not me. You know? And um, so we learn how to love God, love each other, and practice our faith in a practical way in the church. Church is relevant to every believer. This is what drives me crazy about television churches. Right? Or just stay, I just, I just stay at home and watch TV. But the thing is, you're missing out on all the fun of rubbing against all those abrasive people around you in order to refine you and make you a better believer, right? And if you look around, man, this church is full of so many different types of people in it. Isn't it awesome that we're family? I love that, and that's what the gospel does. Red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Red and yellow, black and white on earth, who cares? I want to know if you know Jesus and you're going to heaven. That's, that's what matters. And so Paul wanted to strengthen the church because the church is so important. Listen, we're going we're gonna to close with this idea. God's design for discipleship is the church. The church is entrusted with the business of maintaining the truth, of defending it from the assaults of error and transmitting it, transmitting it to future times. The truth is, in fact, upheld in the world by the church. And the church is you and I, and this is our call. This is it. Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I'm going to stop there. Paul is writing, or excuse me, I think it's Paul, the writer of Hebrews prop properly, doctrinally, is encouraging Jews that have become believers to not go back and trust in their Jewish faith once again in the sense of you don't go back and trust that the sacrifice saves you. You've got to trust in Jesus. Jesus is a greater sacrifice than the law's sacrifice. Jesus is a greater high priest than an earthly high priest. Jesus is greater than the temple. Jesus is greater. You know, he's greater than all these, th all these things. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than all these things. That, it, it talks about the supremacy of Christ as the theme of Hebrews. Why? Because they're tempted to go back to the sign instead of the destination. The sign was the law, the destination was Christ. They've been saved in Christ, but they're being sucked back into this religiosity to trust in it rather than trust in the grace of God. So again, what does he say? By the blood of Jesus, a new and living way, he consecrated us, let us draw near a, a heart of true assurance of faith, right? Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wa wavering for he who promised is faithful. That's how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to hold on to those things of the Lord. White knuckle it. Just do not let go of those basic things of grace that, that keep you just centered in God. Right? Now, can you do that completely on your own? Possibly. But in context, this is why I'm saying this. All these things that he's telling us to do here, in context, these things that he wants to remind us of and hold on to, these theological truths, in context, what does he then say? He says... And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. This is an awesome list he has before that we're to do. And then what are we supposed to do? We're to stir it up in one another. You take a coal away from a fire and, and, and it goes out much quicker than if it's with the fire, right? It cools off. But a fire gets really hot when all those coals are together, right? And, and so... 
Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. All these things above here. Let's be together and stir those things up. Verse 25. Now, it doesn't get much clearer than this. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So the context is, is when you're in a church that's teaching and encouraging the word of God, the theology of God, the practice of God, you're going to be a better believer as you do so. And you know what? If you're in a church where a lot of people bug you, man, you're in the gym. <laughs> get fit. Get stoked. You know, I tell people, you know, and I'm about to finish my, I keep on saying this, but I, I'm, I'm getting closer every week. But I'm about to finish my, my, my doctorate of theology degree, right? As soon as I finish writing that stinking paper, <laughs> I'm done, you know? But I've learned more by being married to another sinner just like myself than I have in any theology book because I'm, I'm living with the sinner. I'm recognizing her sins. I'm recognizing my own sins. And I'm still in the word of God, and I have to apply all kinds of things in the word of God constantly. Right? That's a better seminary than Dallas Theological, than Dallas Baptist, you know, than, than Houston Baptist, whatever. It's, it's a better seminary than the best seminaries than Liberty University. And you know what? My second best seminary is not the seminaries I attended. My second best seminary is you. Oh, thanks, Pastor. Well, yeah. And I'm part of yours as well, right? I remember one of the biggest lessons I learned is when my pastor told me that I had a job at the church, so I quit my teaching job. And it was summertime, and he said, well, in September, we're hiring you. I was off work anyways. Hey, I'm not coming back to my work. About a month later, the assistant pastor came, on to, uh, came, came up to me and he said, we made a mistake. We can't hire you in September. I called up the school. Hey, can I have my job back? They go, no, we've already filled the spot. And my wife was pregnant. Now I don't have a job. And I'm thinking, man, jerk. He was a big problem. But you know what the Spirit told me? Learn your lesson. Learn your lesson. And so we had a, a couple's retreat that we'd already paid for <laughs> at the end of the summer. And I went up to him, and I gave him a big hug, and I said, thank you for the trial. Thank you for the growth, you big jerk. That's exactly what I said. And they ended up hiring me on staff, and I grew there, and he's still my pastor today. You know, what a, what a blessing. That restoration, but also the lessons learned. When you get hurt at a church, it's a good time to grow up and be healed at that same place instead of always running. Because you know what? That church, they were this way. They were such jerks. That church, they were this way. They were such jerks. That, that church, you know, and it's like, wait a second, there's a pattern here. You know, you guys know what a common denominator is? It's us, and we just need to grow up. And we need to be a part of the body of Christ in order for us to be able to do so more quickly and more efficiently. You can survive without the body, but you can't be the best that you can be. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we thank you for your word once again, and we do just thank you for each other, God. And good, bad, or ugly, Lord, we're here for a purpose, and... Lord, sometimes we're sandpaper to others. We are a blessing. And some people to us are sandpaper, and to other people they're, they're just a, a, an easy blessing. But Lord, help us just to learn to appreciate all that you have for us, Lord, and help us not to point our fingers outward, but to be able to go to the strength that you planted in us, your Holy Spirit, which truly transforms us inward, God, that we can truly have the heart of peace towards all men as much as possible within us, God. We would just pray for Calvary Chapel, for this body, Lord, that we may just bless you with the blessings that you pour out upon us, God. And that, Lord, as people come here, it's not for our coffee, it's not for our worship team, it's not for our children's ministry, it's because you have led them here and they know that they are called to be a part of this place. And when they're called to be a part of the, this place, Lord, may they recognize love in this place. Lord, we pray that love would be our greatest form of evangelism as well. Lord, we can speak words, but love shouts so much louder than words, Lord. May we love in the way that you would have us love as a church. 
And may we reach more and more people for your kingdom, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to close this service with a little bit of worship. It's also a time to worship the Lord through your tithes and offerings if you uh, desire to do so uh, during this period in, in time as a form of worship. And it's also an opportunity for you to be prayed for. If you've showed up and you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you and for you. And, uh, and if you're here and you've been backslidden away from the Lord, we'd love to pray for the Holy Spirit just to, to recharge you so that you can, uh, you can live in intimacy with God. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you're here for a reason. It's no accident that you're here. You need to know Jesus. Without Jesus, it doesn't matter how good you are, you've still failed. You're, you're, you're not going to heaven. With Jesus, doesn't matter how bad you were, <laughs> you'll be able to go to heaven because he forgives all your sins. And so you do need Jesus either way. So I encourage you. We'd love to pray with you and for you. Let's go and worship the Lord together. God bless.